just one round to go now in MotoGP. We finished up at Malaysia. It was eventful, very eventful in many ways. I mean, we're going to cover everything now and we're going to look ahead to, well, they're calling it the showdown, aren't they? The big showdown. We've gone to the final round and I get, it is a good thing. that we, You always want to see it go to the final round. How close it is or how much chance there is of it being turned around, uh, I'm not so sure, but we'll get into that all. So we're going to be covering everything here from the Malaysia weekend, looking ahead to what is currently the Barcelona weekend for the for the final showdown. Miller's crash, Yunone's performance, the All Japan Cup, Moto2 and Moto3, all chaptered below. Here we go. And Peko has taken a bit of the sting out of this for us, uh, as has been his nature this season so far. Saturday crash in the sprint. We got to see it from a brilliant position from on board with Mark at the time. It was just, how, the, how did the director know, you know? And then as we went into Sunday, Peko really needed to, um, he had to win. He had to win. And I'm sure exactly what he was hoping for is what he got where Martin was willing to scrap with him. Martin was right there, willing, willing to risk it all to try and beat him in those early laps were crazy. It was awesome. It was a fantastic um, battle early on. Martin didn't give an inch. Peko gave less. Peko coming out on top eventually, which it leaves him with a chance. 24 points, but really he's been he's done himself in once again. And we'll, and this could be the most remarkable season because it's very, very rare that you see a guy win this many races at all. Now, I don't think there's ever been a season. I probably should have looked this up before we started. Has there ever been a season where a guy's won 10 races or more and not been world champion? I don't think it could have possibly happened. It couldn't have happened because until it's what, only the last sort of six, seven, eight years, we've been doing sort of more than sort of 16, 17 races and we've got up towards 20 races. So before that, early 2000s and stuff, you had maybe 16, 17 races, sometimes 15, the Rossi years before that. In like doing and you know the guys from the 90s if you won 10 grand prix it doesn't matter how many times you crash in the rest of them you're probably going to win that championship because you've only got 15 races and then as we've gone on we've gone into the marquez years where we've now had a lot more races 18 19 20 races and when marquez has gone and won all those races he's won the championship so this will i, I can't imagine there's been another time where this will have happened 10 grand prix wins and we have one to go imagine if you won 11 races and you know it's not enough for him He's got to make up 24 points. Theoretically, he'd have to win on Saturday as well now to stand any chance to bring it back. So, you know, you bring it back towards 20 points maybe, depending on how Martin does. 25 points then on Sunday may not be enough if Martin finishes in a decent position. So 10 Grand Prix wins. And this takes us into, I guess, the conversation on sprint races. Does it sit, just tell me, you know, let me know in the comments, how does this sit well with you that a guy can win 10 races out of 19? And let's say he wins 10 out of 20, right? 50% of the Grand Prix and not win the World Championship. I do find it a little odd. I watched MotoGP Mac early in the week, which I love watching Mac. It's like the pinnacle YouTube, MotoGP YouTubers, you know, guys like that. has got a great following, massive following. His channel's brilliant. So he released a video earlier in the week discussing sprint races and if sprint races have decided the title. And he did mention in that that without sprint races, Peko would be 24 points up which makes sense to me because you can crash as much as you want. If you win 20, 10 races, you're probably going to be still leading the world championship. I think that's what he said. I might cross check that right now. Almost 12,000 subscribers max on. So if you're not a subscriber, Matt, get him to 12,000. What a legend. That is an enormous number. Max done the research for me there. Peko will be 24 points ahead if you remove the sprint races. You can look at it as basically, on a basic level and say that, which means that Peko would end up being your world championship by the end of the last round because, I mean, he's a big crasher, Peko. So there is always the chance that he would crash and Martin would win the race and win it by a point. Absolute cinema. That would be amazing in terms of the drama of Motor And it would get eyeballs on it. It'd be great. But you do get the sense that he'd happily take absolutely no risk. He'd come like 10th and he'd be the world champion. Now, the, the other argument... Uh, and it's a, an argument that I've made before, and I actually have written a little piece on it, which I sent out on my Substack for my subscribers on there. You can subscribe to that down below. I don't do that many written pieces, but when I do them, they will go to your inbox. And I did write up a piece on this, and it was about whether we were getting our proper race winner 
on a Grand Prix weekend. What I meant by that, and to summarize, you can go onto my Substack and find the article, but my, my, to summarize it, especially you see it with Peko a lot, he gets a do-over. So let's say we go through Friday, we get through Saturday qualifying, uh, practice and qualifying, and then the only race is on the Sunday. And in that race, we often see, at the moment, with our first race being on a Saturday, you often see Martin or someone, even Mark lately, dominating that race. Pecco never really has been very good in that race. But what he is an expert at is taking what happens on a Saturday and flipping it on a Sunday. On a Sunday, he turns up and he's had a look at the data and he's had a look at his approach and he's worked with the mechanics and the engineer. And maybe they've looked at Pramac data. I don't know what they get access to. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. I got no idea. Someone educate me on that. And then he can take that knowledge, turn it into a race win on Sunday. It's won 10 races. Uh, and he's rarely done well on a Saturday. It's very rare. I don't know how many sprint races he's won. Maybe two. Top of my head, maybe. Has he won three? I don't know, two or three at the most. In that aspect, can, can, you, can it be as basic as, well, Peko would have won those races anyway. If sprints didn't exist, would Peko have won those races? I would make an argument that he wouldn't have won that many. But at the same time, I mean, I guess you can't say that he wouldn't have won them, I suppose. So have the sprint races had too much of an impact? Have the sprint races decided the world championship, which is the point of Max video here? Um, I'll let you go watch that so that um, you can hear his point on it. I don't want to give you tell you what he thinks on it. So while, I mean, I've been a little bit critical of having sprint races, not because of the value and entertainment of them. I am like anyone. I like watching bikes on track and when they're racing, it's racing is what we're here for. So having more races, I guess, is a good thing. I'm a bit of a traditionalist, I guess, if you would call it that, in that I like it, you know, the pinnacle of the sport. So MotoGP in this instance, Formula One, when you're looking at, at, at car racing, should be like the purest form of it. Race, race is on a Sunday. It's the day off of the week before you go back to work on a Monday, you race on a Sunday. You qualify on a Saturday because you had to figure out which order to put the grid on. Like, what order do they start in? I don't know. Well, we better do some time sessions on a Saturday so that we can, you know, whatever. I was like, well, we turn up on a Saturday and like, I don't really know the track. It's like, well, we'll just practice on a Friday then. We'll get in on a Friday. It doesn't matter if no one can come to that. They're at work. And on Saturday, when we're doing the times, you know, the time trials to see who gets to start at the front, then, you know, people can come watch that. It's a Saturday. And then on Sunday, we race because we needed the Saturday to qualify and we race on the Sunday. Everyone can come and watch because it's a day off, you know. That's kind of why the format probably exists, I think, in my head. That's logically, it makes sense. And I like it to be like that. At this level, like, when you're like super bikes and stuff like that, it's not like the absolute pinnacle. You can experiment with the format. Look, I, whether you tell me right now, or am I against the sprint races? Probably not. Leave them, have them if you want. If you don't have them, I'd be happy as well. On a fundamental level, I like it the old school way, but I'm pretty boring like that. I, I understand the point of it. You get more eyeballs on on a Saturday and more people through the turnstiles on a Saturday. It's only a good thing. But as for someone who doesn't need to be entertained by anything other than just bikes on track, which I'm just happy to watch, I, I would be happy with just the old school one hour qualifying. I just love that. One hour qualifying on a Saturday. One hour. No one goes out for 40 minutes. I didn't give a shit. Like, I liked it. Because in the last five minutes, it just went hectic. And I used to live for that. It was great. I'm not the right person to answer this. So... This is not a sort of a debate on the validity of the spreads. It's sort of, have they inf had too much influence on the championship? You know, are they worth too many points? Half the amount of points of a normal race win, maybe it is too much. Should it be maybe 10 points for a win? Like the old Japan Cup scoring system, the old Formula One scoring system, 10, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1, top six get points. Then you have the issue of what's the incentive for someone running in 12th halfway through that sprint in staying out there and pushing to try and get to six when at the moment they only have to push to get to ninth, they get a point. Or the or would you go as all out? I mean, I think that's a good one because you would really go all out to win that because the gap between first and second is four points. So to try and win it rather than come second is a big it's a big amount of points. And then if you're binning off six points, it's not as much of a risk. Maybe that would work. But I mean we could go on I could this is debatable for hours, this one. Uh, but I just wanted to cover that because without the sprints, Peko, te on a base, basic level, Peko would be 24 points ahead is the point of all this whole ramble I've just been on. 
would be 24 points ahead. But then if you actually look deeper, if you actually look deeper, because he's never that good on a Saturday, would you say then that he then wouldn't be that good on a Sunday if the sprint race didn't exist and he didn't have a chance to see what happened on a Saturday and have a mulligan and do it again on Sunday? So in which case, would he still be 24 points down to Martin, who was getting it right first time every time? And he's getting it wrong first time, then getting it right second time. Maybe he'd have only won four or five races. Food for thought. And then I guess the the main question is, is there a chance for Pecco? It's very slim, isn't it? It's very slim. Does anybody think he can do it? In the past, I'd say with Martin, you'd be like, well, there's every chance he's crashing in that Grand Prix. And let's say, let's just say Pecco won the sprint, brought it down by to like 20 odd point, 21 points or something. Yeah, 20 points is still really defendable. I still can't see how Martin would, would lose it. My point was going to be like, what if Martin crashes? But I surely he's smart enough to just, if you're on the edge, just drop back. If you end up going from third to sixth, who cares? Is it worth asking who do you think is going to win? It's probably not. Smart money, obviously. Obviously, he's on Martin. Uh, what else have we got here this week? Let's talk about Miller's crash. Because did anyone else just surprise that Jack Miller's alive? <laughs> like That was crazy. Uh, some of the pictures, I mean, I've seen the video, and some of the pictures are absolutely nuts. Abs- I'm going to put a few up here. I know people don't like it when you watch the bad accidents or whatever. Oh, the guys, oh, they don't show the, they should show the replay. Oh. All right. Here's some pictures. <laughs> I like watching replays of crashes, by the way. I'm one of those weirdos that everybody hates because I like watching the crashes. I like the crashes someone's been hurt in it. I'm like, I still want to know what happened. I still want to see it. I don't want to be blind to it. You know, I'm not over sitting there just joyfully watching it. I'm like, oh my God. But also I like to see the explanation of what happened with, you know, when I say that, I mean, I like to see the incident and understand what happened. How did that occur? What triggered it? Anyway, a couple of pictures here of the, just for me, it's the angle these heads at in one of these here. It's just, and he gets run over, and then he's lying there for a bit. I was conscious the whole time. I think they said he was conscious the whole time. Anyway, the report came back pretty quickly that it was conscious. So if he was knocked out for a little bit, it was only briefly. So by the time I think the medical people got to him, uh, he was conscious, which was great. And uh, just remarkable to see him walking so quickly. Again, it's like Pecco's one where he got run over, obviously with an added twist so to speak uh of having your head jammed in the back of a yamaha but yeah this was a crazy one and it just sent half the bloody paddock flying pretty much uh yeah i just wanted to cover that because it was a absolutely freak accident freak accident i've never seen anything like it um with a head ending up in a position like that uh on a moto gp track andre yanoni uh made an appearance and he was really good on friday and then ended up coming not last on sunday uh, finishing ahead of Lorenzo Savadori. So we, are you impressed with Yonone's performance? I mean, I kind of was. I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect that. And is there a chance? I mean, he's been done in here because there's another guy who'd probably be a chance of beating, which is probably Augusto Fernandez, who actually had a really good week, <laughs> good uh, race on Sunday, ended up 10th. But yeah, let me know if you were impressed or not by uh, Yonone's performance. Okay, so we did mention at the top that potentially the next race is going to be Barcelona now with Valencia, the horrible uh, floods that have happened there. Yeah, I mean, straight away it was obvious there was going to be absolutely no race there. The riders made that pretty clear. They didn't want to race there anyway, uh, and they would expect the resources to be used to obviously put towards the people and their homes and their infrastructure. So racetrack should not be probably high on the priority list there for that local government. I mean, the first report I heard was Qatar in December. I don't know where that came from because that would seem to be well off the mark because it's now going to be, well, at the time of recording this, it's Friday the 8th. It's going to be next weekend in Barcelona. But now there's a lot of reports of, uh, I think it was, I saw this, even just this morning, still now in Girona, which is north of Barcelona, floods there as well. I don't know how close that is. I mean, I've been to the uh, Grand Prix in Barcelona before. Uh, I don't know exactly where these floods are in relation to where the Grand Prix circuit is. So whether it's safe to go there still, I mean, imagine they think by a week's time, flooding rains and and this sort of gushing water may have stopped by then. And so if the circuit isn't affected, then there'll be nothing to, they'll they'll be safe to go there. 
But I don't know yet, is the circuit at any risk? I don't know. I'll have to look into that a bit more. So I don't know what the contingency is if Barcelona now can't go ahead. Maybe it will be Qatar in December. Who knows? And before we get on to the All Japan Cup, I should really learn how to say that in Japanese, shouldn't I? That'd be great, wouldn't it? No, well, we're out of time now anyway. It's the end of the season and I have a sneaking suspicion we're not going to have an All Japan Cup next season because Yamaha might be a bit too good for us to be able to have one. We're just going to have to have a Honda Cup. The Honda Cup. Maybe that's what we'll do next year. But while we're talking about Yamaha and Japanese bikes and all that stuff, Yamaha is building a V4 engine. Now, I guess the question is, like, what do you do here? Is this a V4 engine with a plan of trying to bring that in next year? We know that they probably might even be aiming for that. I mean, I've just read reading here. Alex Renz has said or suggested that they may be in line to bring that in next season at some point. You wonder if it's worth... I mean, maybe these things can be put together pr- quite quickly, but obviously one of the points being made is the V4 engine, not even just about the power. It's uh, Max Bartolini's said an interview on Crash, which I've got up here. As much as the power aspect of it, it does allow you to change the dynamics of the bike a bit, V4 engine. I mean, obviously a straight four, like a flat four engine. It's quite wide, four cylinders all in a row. Maybe compacts the bike front to back a little bit, I guess, as well, because it's it's all sort of towards the front there. The V4, obviously, it's only the width of two pistons side by side, so you can maybe narrow the bike in. He's talking about sort of four to five centimeters or something like that here, or 10 to 15 centimeters. Uh, and obviously, because it's longer front to back, maybe with the length and the sort of squattiness of the bikes these days, it maybe helps you with the geometrics, I guess, of the bike. So aside from even just the power aspect of it, they are looking at that as well as an advantage. Suggestion here from Rins that it could be tried to bring in under this era of engine, the 1,000cc engines, when we do know that in 2027 we go to an 850. So whether it's wise for them, I don't know, to just look to bring it in now and then just modify the engine, you know, obviously have another one on the go for the 850 era when that starts, development on the go with that, but just try and get one in for now just so that maybe for 2026 you can be competitive just for one season, you know. So I guess I'll look at how the engine's coming along. If they think it can be competitive for 26, they'll crack on. If not, they'll probably just go, we'll just skip straight to 2027 with the 850. Uh, So yeah, interesting stuff. It's one of the biggest changes. I mean, did we ever think we'd see it? I think it probably might've been one of those things where it's like, maybe it had to happen eventually. They were being outdated. I mean, I'm not technical enough on engines to know the real, real disadvantages of the inline four. You know, you saw things. I mean, Suzuki, I think, was still running an inline four when they were finished up. They were really competitive. So I don't know if it's like you just can't be competitive with an inline four or if it's that when you're the only one on it, is it just too much of a disadvantage? I mean, i got no idea. Okay, now it's time for the All Japan Cup. Fabio is like the David Alonso of the All Japan Cup. I mean, he, he's won again. And it's really impressive. He's come sixth. <laughs> he's only finished 16 seconds off the lead. I mean, it's not super close, is it? But... I mean, he's six seconds off Bastianini in third, so it's not too bad. Ahead of the Aprilias. And Rins was there as well. So Rins come eighth. So he's second in the All Japan Cup this week. Nice little... um. He's not seen him up there that much lately, so it's good to see him up there. Uh, he's finished eighth. He's finished just behind Vinales. So promising, promising. Still not much promise from the Hondas, but... So Zarco was third. He's Marini four. So Marini's having a nice little run home. And once again, Marini with a real-life MotoGP World Championship point. You love to see it. Two DNFs, Taka and Mir both didn't finish the race this week. Like Mir doesn't finish any races, so that's so in the standings. Fabio one forty. We know he can't be caught. Zarco ninety one, who now can't be caught. Taka seventy one, who cannot be caught for third. Rins fifty eight, who I'd say can be caught for fourth by Marini, but on count back, I think Rins would still hold fourth if he's won a couple of times. I don't know. We'd have to. We're not going to see that as a scenario, so it doesn't matter. Marini, six points ahead of Mir now. So I'd say that's pretty much done. And we asked this question last week. Has Marini had a better season than Juan Mir? Less World Championship points. I get it. But when you take the All Japan Cup system, he's been better. Well and truly. And if you look at the last sort of one, two, three, four. He scored in every one of the last four races, Luca Marini. So he, and I mean, he scored actual points in every single one of the last four races. All right, so Mir's sixth. Bradle and Remy, seventh and eighth. They have not raced again since whenever. Okay, so that's the All Japan Cup done. Let's We've been going. This will be a long video this week because we spoke so much early on about the other stuff. There's a lot to go over. Moto2 was won by Vietti. Uh, yeah, good job. A nice little um, 
hilarious little incident with uh, Jake Dixon doing a uh, Aleish pulling up on the second to last lap just before the line, thinking that it was over. Got passed for third. He's Anguavara. Nice little handover to his teammate there, wasn't it? Just to give him a podium. Is it his first Moto G, uh, Moto Two podium? I think it might be. Uh, so that was a bit of fun. Uh, and while on Guevara, has Izan Guevara arrived in Moto2? Is this his arrival in Moto2? He was very competitive in this race. He was very, very good. He got gifted third, I get it. But, I mean, if he's going to be finishing three seconds off the lead every week, he's going to be finishing in these sort of positions all the time. So hopefully for him, there was so much promise. He was our winner of our power rankings last season. Let's not forget that. So there's a lot of talent there, but something hasn't clicked for him so far. Hopefully, hopefully there's a bit of momentum for him going into next season and he can really start to push. And maybe he will be a title threat next season in Moto2. Let's see. Someone can take 12 months, 18 months for these kids to get this right on Moto2. It's a big step, as we've discussed. Jorge Navarro filling in for Joe Roberts. Pole position and then second in the race. Brilliant. Brilliant. And look, we've talked a lot about Joe Roberts this year because the links to Trackhouse, and when I say the links to Trackhouse, I mean just the fact that he's American. And then how much of a song and dance got made about Joe Roberts not getting that ride and Iagura getting it. And I don't know if it's the same in your country or where you're from, but the British feed that I get was just obsessed with the fact that Joe Roberts didn't get that ride obsessed when they got announced for Iagura you can go back and watch my video on it my take on it all they talked about all weekend was how Joe Roberts should have got that ride because he's American and he has a lush head of hair or some bullshit like that who gives a shit they just wanted the quickest guy they got him they got him and now Joe Roberts someone's come in to fill him for him for one race and being fucking superb so what are we talking about here Where's Joe Roberts in the championship now? I know, like, he's missed this race and whatever, and he missed a race earlier on, but he's ninth in the world championship. Let's say he went out there this week. We know he's one's going to win that. His form's not been great. You know, so everyone too, like, Vietti's yeah, been bang average this season. Well, he's ahead of Roberts in the championship. I cannot believe how much shit they were talking about how Joe Roberts should be on a MotoGP bike next season for the track house. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, it's the same with Garcia. You know, a lot of criticism, a lot of criticism from journalists and stuff in MotoGP um, for some of these big publications, talking about how Garcia got stiffed and, and should be, you know, he was leading the World Championship at the time, so fair fair enough, but got stiffed and f for like Jack Miller getting that um, Pramac ride. It's like, well, tell you what, they'd be counting their lucky fucking stars at this point that they didn't go for him. I mean, I still think there's a rider there, and I still think there's a very big chance to be a contender for the championship next season. But something's happened for him. He needs a re He needs the end of the season badly, Sergio Garcia. He really needs to get to the end of the season. He just needs this to stop, and he needs a reset. There's there's obviously a quality kid in there, and I, but whether he was ready for MotoGP or not, ahead of a guy like Miller or Oliveira, I don't think so. And this has shown it because one setback in the injury, and then not getting called up to MotoGP, and he's just gone completely off the boil. It's like if your headspace is in that sort of position where you're that weak mentally, it's like probably not, mate. You need to you need another season. You need another season at least, and you need to show you can stay there and fight when things when the chips are down, you know. Uh so anyway, that's Moto 2. Moto 3, uh Alonso won again. Do we need to talk about this? Like, I'm not gonna mention Alonso too much here. But the battle for second is up for grabs now because Olgado, big high side, uh coming onto the back straight. Uh, which, again, sent Alonso back to, like, the bottom end of the points, and he's still come back and won it. His kid's remarkable. Ortola and Vaya right into the fight for second. So this is a little exciting one that we have up for grabs coming to the last race now as well. So that'll be cool to watch. I'll go to level with Vaya now. So 236 points each, and then Ortola, 217. So still right in that. So that's on. That's up for grabs. That's one we'll be following along. It's weird in this one. Was there a... Do I remember correctly that there was a couple of bikes just shit themselves in this race, which is a bit strange. You rarely see it at ever, and there was like two in a race, I think. Or was I watching on Saturday or something? Ah, it felt like there was two. I remember Adrian Fernandez had to pull aside. It's someone else. Let me know in the comments. Who was it? Uh, and who else was good in that? Tai Furusato. I really was pulling for him in the end. I really wanted the kid to win this. Nothing against David Alonso, but like just let someone else have a go. 
<laughs> How many is that in a row? One, two, three, four, five, six. Is this field poor or is he a phenom? 17 Grand Prix wins for the kid. Most don't get there. Most great champions don't get to that. Fair play to him. And Tyre for Asato, just while we're on him, I think looks great for next season. Put him in with Pekeras and Luneta as really the ones to watch for next season as in terms of the young, young guys. And hopefully Ralston as well. He's fallen away from those guys a little bit, but he started pretty decent, Ralston. But he just needs to find his head again, you know, um, and string together some more good points finishes. Uh, and that's it. The showdown is coming, um, if you can call it that. It's all pretty much done, isn't it? Um, but, you know, we'll let them run their marketing and try and big it up. And, you know, my team might crash. Does anyone else get the feeling Peko's just going to crash on Saturday and it's going to be done? And we're not going to get the showdown. And then we're going to be like, sprint races have ruined it. Damn it. They've ruined our showdown. Look, best possible scenario is, I don't wish for it to happen. Okay, I won't say this. I was going to say Martin crashes and Peko wins. And then we have like, it's right up for grabs. You know, it's a 12 point gap. He could still bridge that. It puts a lot of pressure on Martin. But I don't really want, let's just say Martin just doesn't score points for some stupid reason. Finishes 10th. Um, because we don't want him to crash, you know. Uh, but it's to say he doesn't score points for some reason, and I think that's the best possible scenario. So it gives us a fight on Sunday, and they really can scrap it out on Sunday. Because really, if you're Banyaya, what you need is for Martin to be in the scrap with you, and you to be extremely, extremely aggressive with him to the point where it's almost dangerous. That's your only chance. You got to make it dangerous for him to be near you, so that there's a chance that you know you push him a bit wide, you lean on him, you just. Sit him up in a corner, maybe he drops the front, you know, you don't know. He clips your back wheel and he's down. You know, you cut in front of him. You just gotta do you gotta get get your hands dirty a little bit if you're Peko here. You've got to be there's no other way to do it. Because he's not just gonna not score enough points, is he? So yeah. Tell me how you say it. We'll see you on the next one. Take it easy.